Hello everybody, it's uh, Michael Pierce here. I wasn't originally intending to do um, a video of my face for a while because I wanted to try to do a little more production value, but I just had the itch to do this, so we're going to go with it. Um, I have an essay here which I'm going to read uh, to you, and you can watch my facial expressions while I do it, I guess. Um, this, um, I guess I'm really kind of putting myself out here a, a little bit. This is an essay which I wrote um, as my writing sample to apply for graduate programs in philosophy. And so I don't know if sharing that information is going to lead to me being very embarrassed, because I, I, this is my first time applying to any kind of graduate programs. Philosophy is extraordinarily competitive. Um, there's all kinds of other... Uh, things ab about it. I, I understand the risks involved in um, going into philosophy and academia, but I'm determined to do it. Anyway, this is this is the essay which I wrote for trying to get into programs. Uh, last year, I wrote it in 2020 after I had finished my book, and um, I want to share it to you now because um, uh, I was not accepted to any of the programs I applied to, um, and that's also, I'm sure, partly because COVID um, has really put an additional strain on universities, so it uh, would have been quite the miracle if I had gotten in. I am planning on applying again this next time around, um, so I'm working on a new essay to try to refine my ideas, I, um, but again, uh, I don't know how embarrassed I'll be sharing this, because as I've tried to do more research and try to do more to figure out how to write the essay, I, looking back on this old essay, I really, I like the ideas, I learned a lot doing it, but I don't know if it was actually really graduate school material, but in, in some sense that's really the problem, is I really don't know. Um, I don't necessarily want to do just what everybody else does. I'd like to stand out, and there are certain conventions that I knew about was, but was willingly flaunting just because that's how I am when I write. So I don't know. I, I don't know um, uh, whether, whether or not anybody watching this will have any good advice, but if anything, I do think it's a good essay regardless of whether or not it's something that would impress anybody in the actual official philosophy area. So um, I did give it a pretentious title. I called it An Inquiry Towards a Coherent Theory of Consciousness. Um, and so in a lot of ways, this was just super helpful for me to work out ideas related to the hard problem of consciousness. So I, uh, it, I'll be interested to know, it might be good for you to have at least some basic background in what is meant by the hard problem. Um, though I don't know if that's necessary because... Um, as you'll see, I've I've almost written this as an essay, as I want to do. I tried to write it as an essay, which could be read, hopefully, by both an expert and a layman, and be enjoyed equally by both. Though I suspect it's more enjoyable, perhaps, for the layman than the expert. Um, but it was my first crack at it, and um, I don't feel like I lost much, if anything, from my from my applying, which was good. So, um, anyway. I will get into reading the essay, and I'll be curious what, if anything, anybody thinks about it. Um, so, uh, I may uh, do some interpolations and stuff as I go through it, though, just to, to skip through some some parts, but it, you'll, you'll get the idea. This will be a little informal in my reading of it. So, prologue, um, or preface, or whatever you want to call it. Philosophers usually avoid narration in their writing because they are trying to represent atemporal ideas, but in so doing, they falsify the subjective process by which they themselves pieced together those atemporal ideas. They try to encapsulate a novel in a painting, which must then be retranslated into a novel by their audience. Excuse me. <laughs> Take a breath. Pause for dramatic, dramatic effect. Ironically, this can lead to greater misunderstandings than if they had simply recounted 
its dialectic as Plato and Descartes did. It. Excuse me, as Plato and Descartes did. Thus, I have written this essay in a loosely narrative style, but since I doubt my writing is comparable to Plato's or Descartes, I provide the following thumbnail sketch of my inquiry. In the first two sections, I critique the materialist reduction of consciousness, first by demonstrating the explanatory gap between mechanics and consciousness, and second, by critiquing the notion of emergent properties. In the third section, I critique both complacent dualism and the immaterialist reduction of matter to mind, as represented by Bishop George Barclay. Finally, in the fourth section, I sketch out a theory to resolve this mind-matter gap by employing a kind of panpsychism modified by a kind of hylomorphism. Excuse me. Section 1. Where is my mind? Since the advent of computer technology, it has become popular to ask whether a computer can be conscious. Now, it seems to me that the politest way to begin answering such a question is to ask a computer itself. So it was that one day I verbally posed the question to my laptop, which I happen to have before me right now. However, I received no response. It was very rude. It then occurred to me that my computer has no ears by which it could hear my question. So I provided an artificial ear in the form of a USB microphone, along with an artificial tongue in the form of a plug-in speaker. Alas, I still elicited no response. I even got my friends to try asking the question in case my computer somehow held a grudge against me. This, too, was in vain. Thinking the problem over, I realized that providing an ear excuse me, I realized that providing an ear and tongue was not enough. I also had to integrate the ear and tongue into the computer's brain so that it could receive the data, understand it, and reverse the process into the tongue. With this end in mind, I began to investigate the mechanics of this process. So I think I will read through this part. This is literally a section where I just detail as, as clearly as I could the actual mechanics of the process of how this works. So I'll actually run through it, though. I'll, I'll talk kind of fast because the point is not so much the is not how USB microphones work. The point is the cause and effect of the process. A USB microphone translates the varying frequency and intensity of air pressure waves, sound, into patterns of electric current understandable by a computer, binary code. In the microphone, a sensitive disc called a diaphragm resonates to incoming sound waves. The diaphragm is attached to a metal coil which is spiraled around an active magnet. As the diaphragm moves, the coil moves back and forth over the magnet inducing an electric current, which I still don't fully understand how that works. I think it's just the magical laws of electromagnetism. Um, it's just how it is. Anyway, we'll just say inducing an electric current whose varying frequency and intensity match that of the original sound waves, because they're from that mechanical motion. This varying current is passed through a microchip circuit designed to sample or measure the current at regular rapid intervals, not unlike a, a speedometer doop, 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 um, tracking a tire's rotation speed. Um, each measurement triggers a switch corresponding to its rounded value, and the switch activates an electric current along a corresponding circuit. Excuse me. Laid along each specific circuit are transformative obstacles like diodes and transistors, which fork and block the current in such a way that its output represents a binary number, e.g. one current is forked into four currents, and the leftmost of those currents is blocked by a transistor, resulting in a final output at the end of 0, 1, 1, 1, which is 7 in binary. These codes trigger more pre-designed switches within the computer's circuit, which produce more binary, binary codes. Thus, the original information of the sound waves is processed through a hyper-complex logic function of pre-manufactured, mechanically contrived algorithms, hardware, which in turn host various meta-algorithms, or software, that compute more specialized outputs. 
It was now clear to me that, in order to ask my computer a question and receive an answer, I would have to design a software algorithm to compute the input of my voice into an output of audio responses. In other words, I would have to tell my computer what to say back to me. And that, I realized, is merely a roundabout way of talking with myself. Imagine, for example, that you ask me out on a date to Searle's Chinese Cuisine. If you're in the know, then you'll laugh when I <laughs> if that stupid joke. I'm, I'm aping off of um, John, uh, John Searle's uh, Chinese Room here with, I guess, a little bit of modification. But anyway, um, I, uh, you ask me out on a date. Um, I agree, but on condition that you read an instruction booklet which I wrote for you. This booklet prescribes responses to every possible contingency in a conversation. The net effect is that you act out the role of my perfect fantasy partner. For instance, when asked, if you like philosophy, you must reply, according to the instructions, of course, I love philosophy. And, when asked who your favorite philosopher is, you must reply, Friedrich Nietzsche. In some instances, you are told to flip a coin or roll a die in order to determine your response from a list of possibilities, but at no point are you allowed to draw from your own subjective material to answer a question. You may not improvise. Instead, if you are ever asked a question not covered in the instructions, or if you encounter a contradiction in the instructions, you are simply to make a beeping noise and say, error. In such a scenario, you never make an appearance on the stage. You are merely an actor reading a script. This left me with a startling thought. Why, every program in my computer is this way. An actor's script. Meaning, if my computer is indeed conscious, then it is in an awful state, being literally incapable of saying what it really thinks. Surely I must liberate this poor homunculus from its silicon prison and restore to it the means of computation. The fuse of my passion thus freshly, <laughs> the fuse of my passion thus freshly lit, I plunged again into my investigation. The trouble I realized is that the normal methods of determining a human's consciousness, such as asking them are not applicable to computers. In a sense, I was attempting to communicate with a perpetual coma patient, but I felt that this was just as well because it pushed me to find a more direct method of determining and examining consciousness. So I took up a new inquiry supplemental to the first, what is the source that generates consciousness? To answer this question, I decided I should examine something I already knew to be conscious, namely a human being. Once I had identified the source of human consciousness, I could search for its analog in my computer. Thus, I asked a nearby human being whether they were conscious, and while they stared at me, doubtless baffled by my intellect, I analyzed how it was that they gave an answer. I don't think I'll read this part because it's rather long, but I do the same thing I do with the USB microphone. Um, I mean, if you complain, then I'll post it in the comments below so you can read it. But it's I'm, I'm deathly afraid that I got something wrong either here or in the USB microphone section. So especially with the USB microphone thing, let me know if I was totally wrong on something. Um, I mean, it doesn't really matter now because I was already rejected and I'm writing a new essay. But I would be interested to know. Um, if I got it wrong in my research. But anyway, I, I go through all the whole mechanical process of, of the ear, which is similar. You have like a diaphragm and you have, um, which is the ear eardrum, which reverberates and you have a series of bones, which it causes the bones to move and the bones tap on the cochlea, which is the spiraled thing. And it, it you know, there's this mechanical transmission of the um, characteristics of the sound, which are then encoded into neural transmissions, which are similar-ish to binary code, but they're not encoded in the same way. They're binary in the sense that there's either a, a shock or not. You you have to get over this sort of hump of action. Per, put, oh, look at me saying I'm not going to explain it. <laughs> the point is that I you can run through this whole thing in this mechanical cause and effect way, and at the end, it remains unclear at what stage of the process the consciousness happened. 
Um, so I'll read the ending point here. So several thousand cochlear neurons gather at the spiral ganglion where they bundle into a cable or branch, and this branch joins with another neural branch, one that's associated with balance, and the two form the vestibulocochlear nerve. This nerve then winds its way up through the brain, passing through a series of neural junctions where signals are combined, halted, amplified, or redirected according to the algorithmic pre-wiring of the pathways and the competing inputs from other pathways. Unfortunately, the sheer number of neurons in the brain, approximately 86 billion, has forestalled the scientific establishment from understanding the exact logic of these pathways, which, yes, I know, changes, uh, which further complicates things. But that they are algorithmic remains, for now, a foregone conclusion. Section 2. Emergent Properties and Illusions I confess that, at this point, I began to despair. On the one hand, how was I to find the holy grail of consciousness in a forest of neurons more numerous than the galaxy's stars? And on the other hand, there was no hint that I would find anything but trees in this wood, that is, nothing but relays, algorithms, and scripts, a closed circuit of cause and effect with no light bulb of consciousness attached to it. In the words of G.W. Leibniz, quote, supposing that there were a machine so constructed as to think, feel, and have perception, we could conceive of it as enlarged, and yet preserving the same proportions so that we might enter into it as into a mill. And this granted, we should only find on visiting it pieces which push one against another, but never anything by which to explain a perception." Unquote. That's from the Monadology, section 17. And this, I realized, was because I had no idea what I was even searching for. I had assumed it would be obvious when I saw it, some kind of central nexus of all these pathways where the mysterious transmutation of electric pulses into consciousness takes place, like blood oxygenating in the lungs. But the only thing that had become obvious was my own ignorance and confusion about consciousness, whether in a human or in a computer. Fortunately, my determination weathered this winter of despair. I thought to myself, scientists have not yet unraveled this mystery for you, and you do not have the resources or training to undertake scientific research yourself, but you might still do what philosophers have done since Democritus, successfully predict, by the sheer shrewdness of the intellect, what scientists will confirm with experimentation later. So, with refreshed hopes, I began to review the hypotheses available to me. Whew, deep breath. The first of these, which I encountered early due to its popularity, is called the emergent theory of consciousness. I saw, it, I saw it most clearly expressed by Professor John Searle, who writes, quote, Consciousness is caused by lower-level neuronal processes in the brain and is itself a feature of the brain. Because it is a feature that emerges from certain neuronal activities, we can think of it as an emergent property of the brain. An emergent property of a system is one that is causally explained by the behavior of the elements of the system, but it is not a property of any individual elements, and it cannot be explained simply as a summation of the properties of those elements. The liquidity of water is a good example. The behavior of the H2O molecules explains liquidity, but the individual molecules are not liquid. That's from The Mystery of Consciousness, uh, page 17 uh, through 18. This, I thought at first, was an ingenious solution to my problem. There is no single designated organ which magically produces consciousness. On the contrary, consciousness emerges from some collection of electric relays. Consciousness is like a pointillist painting, or an orchestra, or a rainbow. Poetic imagery abounds. But the principle is that the individual parts of a whole need not share the same properties as that whole. The whole thus becomes a sort of Hobbesian leviathan, granted exceptional powers by its own political body, and therefore both sovereign over it and yet contingent upon it. 
However, a troubling question then occurred to me. What legitimizes this jump from a sum of individuals to a qualitatively different whole? In other words, what actually makes a matrix of pixels an image, or a collection of H2O molecules wet, or a jumble of airwaves music? Why consciousness does that? The reason that H2O molecules give rise to wetness without being themselves wet is because wetness is the subjective experience or qualia of H2O molecules against one's skin. It is the same with rainbows and paintings and symphonies. Their ontology, their being, is only subjective. They can exist only as phenomena for consciousnesses. As Democritus said, quote, by convention sweet and by convention bitter, by convention hot, by convention cold, by convention color, but in reality, atoms and void, unquote. That's DK68B9, which I found in McKeerahan, 1994, fragment 16.50. Maybe I'll just put the references in the description below instead of having to <laughs> say them every time. Anyway, we do not say, for instance, that redness causes photons to move at a lower frequency, but rather that the frequency of the photons causes the experience of redness in human consciousness. Thus, to explain consciousness as an emergent property is to beg the question, for consciousness is itself the ground of emergent properties. Ironically, Professor Searle makes this very point, even as he argues that consciousness is somehow exempt from it. Quote, computation is not a machine process like neuron firing or internal combustion. Hmm, excuse me. Rather, computation is an abstract mathematical process that exists only relative to conscious observers and interpreters. Observers, such as ourselves, have found ways to implement computation on silicon-based electrical machines, but that does not make computation into something electrical or chemical." Unquote. Patterns of electricity or chemicals are no more computational than low-frequency photons are red. Computation only exists for consciousness, because only consciousness can read semantics out of syntax and syntax out of physics. So, Professor Searle is quite right that, quote, semantics is not intrinsic to syntax and syntax is not intrinsic to physics, unquote, precisely because Consciousness is what bridges them, e.g. for consciousness A to emerge from a group of quantum particles, it requires another consciousness, consciousness B, to read consciousness A into the quantum text. But consciousness B must in turn be read out of the quantum text by consciousness C, and so on ad infinitum. However, I was not yet convinced by my own argument, for although some emergent properties only exist in consciousness, i.e. they are subjective, others are independent of consciousness, and they obtain to objectivity. For example, weather is an emergent, excuse me, an emergent property of atmospheric pressure fluctuations, which are in turn an emergent property of quantum particles, if you go down the, the hierarchy of science. Yet no one would call the devastation of hurricanes or of tornadoes subjective. As Professor, Professor Searle notes, quote, Some entities, mountains, for example, have an existence which is objective in the sense that it does not depend on any subject. Others, pain, for example, are subjective in that their existence depends on being felt by a subject. They have a first-person or subjective ontology, unquote. Now, I approve of his statement regarding subjective or first-person ontology, but I do not see how the existence of mountains qua mountains, I'll just say as mountains, I was being fancy, mountains as mountains is exempt from it. For I have met many a Midwesterner who scoffed at calling the Appalachia mountains, just as any human would scoff at an ant calling a molehill a mountain. For that matter, the 
The term mountain is used in a host of metaphorical contexts, such as a mountain of a man or the mountain of the Lord's house. It is a qualitative term and is therefore relative to a conscious subject. I could, of course, define mountain quantitatively as between 100 billion and 100 quadrillion pounds of rock, but then I encounter similar problems when defining the word rock. The only way to completely escape such difficulties is to reduce the mountain down to an immense amalgamation of quantum particles. In other words, I must strip it of all its qualities, yet without these qualities it ceases to resemble what I or Professor Searle or an ant each really means by the word mountain. The concept of a mountain is inextricable from its place in an individual's or a culture's way of life in relation to it. For Midwesterners, it is something imposing on the horizon and something dangerous one can climb. But for an ant, it is not parsed from the environment as a single entity called mountain, but rather as tens of thousands of different territories with different dangers and opportunities for food. Uh, those of you who are in the know know that I am very much invoking Heidegger there. I did it accidentally. I only kind of started realizing, oh, that's what Heidegger is talking about, or at least a part of what he's talking about. Anyway, thus... Quantum particles, or whatever is the ultimate constituent of objective reality, form the raw text of ontology, which various conscious subjects read and interpret according to their way of life. It is the same with hurricanes. Granted their effects are devastating, to whom are they devastating? They are not devastating to the amoeba or to the fish. The devastation is real but only in relation to someone for whom that judgment is meaningful. Without that conscious perspective, all one can say is that some quantum particles moved. It is consciousness which sees a tiger crouching in the brush instead of innumerable quantum particles in innumerable relations with each other. For consciousness is always from a particular subject's perspective and formed by that subject's desires, needs, and concerns, e.g. the concern that one could be mauled by a tiger. Again, that's very Heideggerian. I was surprised at how Heideggerian the elements of this essay were when I looked at it again. So, emergence theory is not, excuse me, emergence theory did not appear acceptable to me. Um, and we are going to end this segment there just so that I don't, I want to make sure I don't get cut off because that's what this camera does. So we're going to pick up next time on that cliffhanger. Oh no, uh, emergence theory has been slain by my blade of, of superior reasoning, but, <laughs> but, but we're going to get on to, um, uh, uh, Daniel Dennett next time. Um, though it's a briefish section anyway. Okay.